Howdy, y'all. The melting pot that is history. The accounts taken from the winner's perspective. The secrecy and downright lies we've been fed about a feudal system which, at its core, has been developed from the practices of proto-religion. One must ask, is there anything in the history books where all the ancient beliefs interpreted with a watchful eye of New Age skepticism can come full circle to allow us to view an overarching old world narrative? Why, yes. Yes, there is. In today's video, for July 15th, 2022, fitting as such, I'd like to discuss in all likelihood the most important battle of the 15th century, which occurred according to the narrative exactly 612 years ago today, on July the 15th, 1410. This battle is known as the Battle of Grunwald, also referred to in many older sources as the First Battle of Tannenberg. Why I chose this specific battle to enlighten you about today, besides the fitting date, is due in part to the earlier causes and later effects which this battle would inflict on the majority of the known world. As always, take the history provided with a grain of salt, as many history books tend to lean towards the narrative of the winners. However, the decisive battle of Grunwald has, in recent years, been pulled away from the proverbial memory hole and re-examined by scholars from both sides, which as we dive into the narrative, sides is a term I use loosely as it relates to Grunwald. While not considered a world war by any means, the Battle of Grunwald was one of the first battles in Europe which incorporated troops and soldiers from nearly the entire European continent and beyond. So, without further ado, let's dive into the Battle of Grunwald as presented in the current narrative. My main goal here is to familiarize you with the key events leading up to, during, and after the battle, providing you with a brief description of these key events while allowing you to draw your own conclusions as to the impact each had on European history. First, we have the Teutonic Order, also known as the Order of Brothers of the German House of St. Mary in Jerusalem. The Teutonic Order was the official military branch of the Catholic Church, responsible for countless crusades under the auspices of converting the population of these lands to Christianity. The Teutonic Order began when German merchants from Lebec and Bremen encountered difficulties on their travels to the Holy Land, Jerusalem, roughly around the year 1190. The order, at this time, was created to aid these weary travelers. However, the first thing of note that the Teutonic Order did was overtake and capture the hospital in Acre. From here, they declared themselves the Teutonic Order, much to the dismay of the local population. However, soon after this declaration, their endeavors would be legitimized by Pope Clement III, and in 1191, the Teutonic Order became the most important aspect of the Catholic Church in Outremer, a name given to the four Catholic Crusader realms in the Middle East. From here, the Teutonic Order heavily taxed and tolled the ports of Acre, gathering much wealth for the Church. However, the people of the Middle East did not take kindly to the Teutonic Knights being there, and eventually, after many bloody battles, the knights and the order were pushed out of Acre and out of the Middle East. From here, the Teutonic Order moves to Transylvania in 1211, again creating or capturing many castles and defensive forts, all under the auspices of defending the Kingdom of Hungary from the approaching Cumans. One thing you'll notice in this discussion is the Teutonic Order, besides ransacking the wealth of these areas, often overstay their welcome, if they had a welcome at all. While the Teutonic Knights did help defend the Kingdom of Hungary, the Knights also attempted to turn their castles and the land they captured within Hungary into their own ethnic state. Andrew II, King of Hungary, quickly moved his forces to expel the Teutonic Order. For the next century or so, the Teutonic Order would become, by most accounts, the wealthiest military order in the entire world with access to countless weapons, armor, machines, ammunition, and inventions which constantly gave the Teutonic Knights the upper hand. Their troops numbered in the thousands, but this number could be considered arbitrary, as with the wealth of the entire Catholic Church, the Knights were essentially able to buy any land they traveled to, or hire the most elite of mercenaries from that land to basically do the conquering for them. The main goal, even throughout the 14th century, of the Order, was the conversion of Europe away from paganism. In the late 14th century, after conquering and converting Prussia, with the goal all but achieved 
Only one patch of land separated the Teutonic Order from their plan to eradicate paganism in Europe. That land was Lithuania. The land of Lithuania was the last pagan country in all of Europe. Many Prussians had fled their land for Lithuania. As the Teutonic Order approached the final pagan lands, we see one of the first documented cases of political jockeying. The root cause here, as stated by the Catholic Church for the Teutonic Order in Europe, was to convert these areas to Christianity, to establish hospitals, and to get rid of paganism. Putting their money where their mouth was, so to speak, the King of Poland, Vladislav, was also testing the audacity of the Teutonic Order's claims for being there by announcing in the year 1387 officially that Lithuania had converted to Christianity. For all intents and purposes, this should have ended the need for a Teutonic Order in Europe, as with the Christianizing of Lithuania, all of Europe had, at least according to the history books, left behind paganism, which was the sole purpose of the Teutonic Order's presence. However, as you probably already guessed, the Teutonic Order, the knights literally responsible for gathering the majority of the wealth for the Catholic Church, did not end their campaign in Europe at this time. They instead continued to attack Prussia and Lithuania, besieging non-Christian castles and towns and laying waste to anyone who refused their advances. At this point, roughly 1390, the King of Poland, Vladislav, alongside his cousin Vytautis the Great, received intense public questioning by the Teutonic Order over whether their conversion to Christianity was legitimate or not. This was fueled by Konrad Zollner von Rothstein and Hungarian King Sigismund of Luxembourg, who both accused the Polish King Vladislav of treasonous behavior. These charges were even brought before the papal court. At the same time, the larger public outcry against the Teutonic Order was growing, especially in Samojitsia, where large pagan circles still amassed and refused to accept Christianity. This all culminated in the 1409 pagan uprising in Teutonic-controlled Samojitsia. This uprising, led by pagan forces, was first supported by Vytautis, Grand Duke of Lithuania. When the Teutonic Order threatened to invade, Vytautis and Lithuania gained the support of Poland and King Vladislav. Seeing this as an opportunity to eliminate both of these birds with one stone, so to speak, Grand Master of the Teutonic Order, Ulrich von Union Jin, declared war on the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania on August the 4th, 1409. Now, this is where things get very strange. Before diving into the actual history of the battle, there's a few things worth noting here. First, after Ulrich, Von Union Jin of the Teutonic Order declares war on Poland and Lithuania. He almost instantaneously invades Poland. His reasoning for this? He believes the battle will be easily won and doesn't want to waste time gathering his troops. He decides to take Poland first before focusing on Lithuania. And his strategy appears to pay off as the Teutonic Order successfully captures or destroys Dobrin, Bobrniki, Bromberg, and several smaller castle towns in Poland. Instead of advancing further, however, Ulrich von Union Jin instead decides to try to mediate the tide of war by having an official meeting with Vladislav and Vytautis. This meeting, for some reason, is moderated by a figure seemingly venerated by both sides, that is, Wenceslaus, King of the Romans. At this meeting, a truce is signed which runs from October the 8th, 1409, through June the 24th, 1410. However, the truce is anything but. During this roughly eight-month period of time, troops from both sides gather at their respective territories, using that time to train, to forge weaponry, to purchase mercenaries, and to hurl insults at one another. We are told thousands of letters are sent back and forth between the opposing factions, each accusing the other of disrupting or corrupting the ideals of Christianity. This culminates when Wenceslas, king of the Romans, receives a, quote, donation of 60,000 florins from the Teutonic Order, after which time Wenceslas then declares that the Teutonic Order are the rightful owners to all the disputed land. The Order then goes on to donate 300,000 ducats to Sigismund of Hungary, 
who would use his influence to try to tear apart the Polish and Lithuanian Union. Sigismund would offer Vytautis a kingdom, making Vytautis king if he agreed to backstab his cousin and Poland. Vytautis adamantly refuses, while at the same time, Vytautis also acquires the services of the Livonian Order, a military order similar to that of the Teutonic. By the end of 1409, both sides were ready for the truce to end and engage in battle. The Teutonic Order was confident. It had much more money at its disposal, could hire troops or mercenaries by the army fool, had more advanced equipment, better armor, better weaponry, including catapults and early cannons, and overall had a regimen of thousands of Europe's most elite and well-trained troops. But what the Teutonic Order didn't have, and really what they never had throughout their history, was the help of who were considered by many to be the most skilled warriors and the most intelligent warriors of their time. That is, the Golden Horde, or the Tartarians. Besides the way it reshaped history four centuries to come, the Battle of Grunwald is important in our modern research of ancient and lost history because it encompasses some of the most sought after groups of people from this time period, those mysterious groups which we have done research on. The Tartarians, the Teutonic Order, they're groups which we struggle to perceive in realistic ways apart from the myths and the legends of grandeur which we have been provided with. In some cases, these things have been hidden from us throughout the current narrative, but the Battle of Grunwald is decisive because like an early version of a world war, it seems to encapsulate all these major and mystical European powers into one all-inclusive battle. Furthermore, the battle itself includes key events, troop movements, which would go down in infamy in all of European history. On one side, we have the Teutonic Order and its allies, Pomeranian Stetten, the Duchy of Oles, multiple bishops of Europe, mostly German, including Westphalia, Frisia, Austria, Swabia, Bavaria, as well as countless hired mercenaries, all paid for directly out of the pocket of the Catholic Church. The total number of troops on the Teutonic side are considered to be anywhere from 11,000 to upwards of 27,000 skilled men, all of which are said to be fully equipped with the latest armor and weaponry available in Europe. On the other side, we have the Kingdom of Poland and the Duchy of Lithuania, led by King Vladislaw II and Grand Duke Vytautis. However, their side was supported by a who's who of famous or infamous European and Middle Eastern dynasties, including Masovia Warsaw, Plok, Bels, Pomerania Stolp, Moldovia, Bohemia, Moveria, Silesia, Wallachia, the elite horseback knights known as the Hussites, and most importantly, the Tartarians or the Golden Horde. All in all, the number of troops on the Polish side was estimated between 16,000 and upwards of 39,000 men. According to the narrative, the battle occurred as follows. The Polish-Lithuanian armies met roughly 50 miles south of the Prussian border. Their plan was to march in unison the whole way to the Teutonic Order capital of Malborg Castle in Prussia. As the troops arrived, a pontoon bridge, or bridge made out of boats, was created to cross the Vistula, the longest river in all of Poland. This coordinated effort by a multi-ethnic group of soldiers was the first of many successes showing the unity these foreign bodies achieved in such a short period of time. The pontoon bridge was created on June the 24th, 1410, and by the 30th of June, all of the estimated 30,000 troops had crossed the pontoon bridge. On July 3rd, the Army of Poland began its march towards the Prussian border, and the army then crossed the Prussian border into Prussia on July the 9th. Unbeknownst to Teutonic leadership, the nearly week-long crossing of the Vistula by the Polish army was done completely in secret as to not alert the Teutonic order of their plan or to allow the order to send troops to defend. The Teutonic order, which was in part 
busy invading and controlling uprisings in Prussia, did not hear about the Polish army's advancement until a group of Hungarian merchants who encountered the Polish army rushed ahead of the Polish army to inform the order. When Teutonic Grand Master Ulrich von Union Jin realized the magnitude of what was happening, he reportedly ordered all but 3,000 of his men to the front lines to create a defensive shield and meet the Polish army on the battlefield. Union Jin was tasked with crossing a large river himself, the Jerwens. However, after much contemplation with his Council of Eight, he decided to march his troops eastward, bypassing major rivers, to meet on a portion of land open and undisturbed by natural imbalances. As the Teutonic Order marched east, the Polish army marched north. Union Jin was apparently informed of massive looting and destruction of the Teutonic castles occurring by the Polish army and their friends on their way north. According to the narrative, this angered Union Jin so much that he vowed to not only destroy the Polish army, but to embarrass them on the battlefield. When the two armies finally met on July the 15th, 1410, their location was roughly one and a half miles south of the village of Grunwald. The Polish army had the Polish troops to the left flank, the Lithuanian troops backed by the Tartarians to the right flank, and the cornucopia of mercenary and hired troops in the middle. The Teutonic Order formed a similar line of troops parallel and just north of the Polish army. Here, the Teutonic Order attempted to provoke the Polish army into attacking first. The Teutonic Order had dug trenches, hoping to capture riders on horseback, as well as dug numerous pits filled with spikes and covered over again with earth in hopes of capturing more Polish troops on foot. However, Vladislaw, seeing the Teutonic troops in their far more advanced but heavy armor and artillery facing the raging summer sun, did not advance. Instead, he waited nearly all day as the Teutonic troops stood in formation in the beating sun awaiting orders from their captain. This mental warfare not only discouraged the Teutonic knights, but it actually forced some of them out of the battle due to heat stroke. An ever overzealous leader who really had no respect for his enemy, the Teutonic Grand Master Union Jin would then do something which would really change the course of European history forever. Union Jin. While his troops waited in the boiling sun, hatched a plan hoping to provoke the Polish army to attack. He had two of his higher ranking Teutonic Knights on horseback ride into the Polish army camp. Here, the Teutonic Knights delivered Union Jin gift with Vladislaw and Vytautis. The gifts were too finely decorated yet dull swords, which Union Jin said were to give, quote, the Polish army confidence to attack. This was one of the greatest insults and provocations ever committed on a battlefield. The two swords, later known as the Grunwald swords, would become a symbol of Polish freedom, and they continue to be used in Polish symbolism even to this day. After this provocation, Vytautis, along with the Tartarian Golden Horde, first marched on the left flank of the Teutonic Knights. The battle would continue for over an hour. Some sources say the Teutonic Knights ravaged the Lithuanian and Tartarian troops, while others say the Lithuanian and Tartarian troops feigned a defeat and retreated. But either way, this large portion of the Polish army, consisting of both Lithuanian and Tartar troops, began a full retreat. As the Teutonic Knights marched forward, they pillaged everything from the army camps left behind, claiming what is said to be thousands of pounds of gold and armor and weaponry. As the Lithuanian and Tartarian troops retreated, Teutonic Grand Master Union Jin then advanced on the Polish troops that remained. He ordered that six of the banners chasing the Lithuanians return to the battlefield to assist in the quick defeat of the Polish army. Union Jin. And his troops advanced rapidly, seemingly defeating the Polish troops with ease. At one point, Union Jin even ordered a whopping one-third of his entire Teutonic army to attack in unison 
the banner which housed the king of Poland, Vladislav. Vladislav unleashed his second and third lines of defense, but to no avail, and the skill Teutonic army was seemingly too much for him to overcome. Nearing defeat, Vladislav waited as Teutonic troops ravaged his personal army and banner. When Vladislav was spotted, multiple attempts were made on his life. Leopold of Kokoritz, a talented Teutonic knight, had a direct line to Vladislav and attempted to move in for the kill. Within feet of the king of Poland, Leopold lifted his blade to strike down the fearful king, only to have his strike blocked, not by a warrior, not by a soldier, but by a clergyman and the best friend to King Vladislaw, his secretary, Zibinu Olesniki. Olesniki would then shuffle the king through the enemy lines away into safety. After the war, Olesniki would become one of the most popular and influential figures in all of Poland. As the battle grew closer to an end, with the Polish defeat eminent, something occurred which the Teutonic Knights could have never predicted, something they had never seen before, but something that the Polish were all too familiar with. In the year of 1399, at the Battle of Vorkslav River, current King of Poland, Vladislav, had experienced a battle tactic which he had never seen before, a feigned retreat. This tactic would you believe it, was introduced to warfare by the Tartarians of the Golden Horde. Vladislav, at the battle in 1399, believed he had already won and he entered into the lands of the Tartar camp after the Tartars had retreated. Little did they know, the Tartars had not retreated, in a sense, but instead they reworked their troops to surround Vladislav. What occurred next was an abrupt defeat of Vladislav, which left him as one of the only ones of a handful of men in an army of thousands who survived this Tartarian war tactic. As Vladislav faced eminent defeat in the 1410 Teutonic Order Battle of Grunwald, and as the Teutonic Order openly mocked the Polish warriors and ransacked their camps, history would again rear its beautiful head and change the course forever. Unbeknownst to Vladislav and the struggling Polish army, the Tartarians, along with a large portion of the Lithuanian troops, had actually feigned their retreat, instead relocating and surrounding the advancing Teutonic Knights. As the Knights pulled away from the horde under orders from Union Jin, and the Teutonic Knights all began to flow inwards towards the center of the battle. This allowed the Golden Horde, the Tartars, and the Lithuanians to easily surround the Teutonic Knights. And just as the Knights had breached the banner lines of the Polish King Vladislav, Vytautis, and the Lithuanian and Tartarian troops attacked. Upon realizing that he was surrounded and noticing that over half of the army of Poland and Lithuania had returned to the battlefield from what he thought was retreat, the Teutonic Grand Master Union Jin attempted to flee through the Lithuanian front lines on horseback. He was met with a lance through the neck. Leaderless and surrounded, the Teutonic Order tried their best to flee. Here is another absolutely interesting fact here. One we don't often see addressed in the narrative is that in wars and battles in this time, according to this narrative, both sides had something called camp followers, aka groups of civilians, mostly women, who would follow the battle providing medical care, food, and other amenities to the soldiers. We're told in the case of the Battle of Grunwald, once the Teutonic Grand Master Union Jin was killed and Teutonic Knights attempted to retreat, their own camp followers turned on them picking up weapons off the battlefield and joining the Polish in the attack. Eventually, we're told, the Teutonic Knights were surrounded in a small area where they had begun to build what was called a wagon fort, or a wall of wagons surrounding them to defend them. The Knights refused to surrender, and here it is stated that even more Teutonic Knights were killed than on the battlefield. Of the official 
270 highest ranking brothers of the Teutonic Order, between 203 and 211 of them were killed during this one day battle of Grunwald. This completely changed the trajectory of European history. First, the Teutonic Order single handedly placed the blame for the loss in the Battle of Grunwald on Nicholas von Reins, commander of the Calm Banner. During the battle, von Reins was also known as the leader of the Secret Lizard Union, a union which worked to fight lawlessness but really opposed the Teutonic Order. Somehow, Renz, who was part of the Teutonic Order, ended up facing familiar faces during the Battle of Grunwald, at which point he lowered his banner, indicating submission and refusing to fight against his Polish brothers. For this, after the battle, the Teutonic Order publicly shamed him and his family, they blamed him for the loss, they beheaded him in the streets, and they killed every single male member of his bloodline. The Lizard Union would continue in secret as well, becoming the basis for the Prussian Confederation, a movement to remove the Teutonic Order from Europe. The Teutonic Order retreated to the Order's capital castle, Malbork. Instead of marching rapidly to secure the full defeat of the Teutonic Order, the Polish army remained in Grunwald for some days celebrating its victory before slowly, estimated roughly nine miles a day, marching north toward Malbork Castle. This absolutely immense castle, which I'll depict in some photographs here, could be a topic of its very own video, but for now just understand the sheer magnitude and advanced nature of this castle. When the Polish army finally arrived here, they were still drunk on victory from the Battle of Grunwald, and they failed to realize that the Teutonic Order were fighting for their capital and for their proverbial lives. The Teutonic Order held off the onslaught of the Polish army, and the Order never once let their capital castle of Malbork be lost. While the Teutonic Order was unable to be quelled by the Polish army, they were fined severely according to the Peace of Thorn, which was signed in 1411. Here, the Order was required to return much of the land to the respective kingdoms that it had taken it from. However, not nearly all of the Teutonic lands were returned. The real kicker, and the real reason, according to this narrative, that the Teutonic Order lost power after the Battle of Grunwald is because the Order was required by the Peace of Thorn to pay massive amounts of reparations for the damages and atrocities which it committed. This essentially caused a huge rift between the Church and the Teutonic Order, and it caused the frivolous spending of the Order to cease. Since most, if not all, of the European countries were Christianized at this time, and because the Order's deeds became more well-known and frowned upon, the Teutonic Order had a very hard time finding knights after this point. They had many wealthy businessmen, yes, but the warrior class of the Order was few and far between. The Teutonic Order began facing more public questioning of its practices for the next hundred years, which finally led to the Prussian Confederation arising from the Lizard Union in 1441 as a way to expel the Teutonic Order for good. This, in return, led to the 13 Years' War of 1454. And I'm going to end the video there. Do you see why this history is important? To further this concept more, for those of you not from Poland or Germany, myself included, can you see how the Battle of Grunwald would influence the memories of people hundreds of years later? We're told the Battle of Grunwald, and indeed the defeat of the Teutonic Knights, would lead to centuries of hardships and disdain for Poland by Germany, culminating in the war propaganda and invasion of Poland during the World Wars. Do you see how it could be about more than just religion? It could be about ancient history as well. We've been taught for centuries that both Soviet and German leaders stemming from Germanic tribes in the feudal system often held political grudges towards the people of Poland and the surrounding regions. With the assistance of the Tartarian Empire, or the Golden Horde, which was seemingly, purposefully, written out of this history, only to be rediscovered in the 1950s, we can also see a point of reference here from the hostilities of the German Europeans towards the Muslim people. On the other side, the Grunwald Swords and the defeat of the Teutonic Order became a great symbol of pride of Poland, Lithuania, and the surrounding nations. The two-sword symbolism is still used in modern times to show Polish pride, and the defeat of the Teutonic Knights is one of, if not, the most important occurrence in ancient Polish history. For Americans, think about the American Revolution and what we were taught that that should mean to us. 
for Poland and the surrounding areas, this Battle of Grunwald became like their Independence Day. It is one of the most important dates in all of European history. Essentially, changing the world from a place that was fearful of crusaders, fearful of being conquered by unreasonable men, to a land of somewhat unified freedom, where as long as you had strong bones and a strong moral to stand on, you could achieve some sort of freedom for your kingdom. I think that is the most important lesson to learn here. One of the key factors in history and the uprisings that occur and the battles that follow, to me, are something worth much more research. The Battle of Grunwald is the most important battle I have discussed so far in all of my research, encompassing aspects of many parts of old world life across many borders to incorporate the skilled horse soldiers, the elite Tartarians, the bountiful and rich Teutonic order, and the united, growing, formerly pagan populations of Poland and Lithuania. This was by far my most detailed video to date, and I just hope throughout this research with me, you were able to enjoy yourself and learn a little something as well. If you'd like to support my channel or the work that I do, you can do so at this link right here. Please let me know what you think about the epic battle of Grunwald in the comment section down below. Is there anything that you feel that I've left out or didn't address in this narrative? And what stands out to you the most about this narrative? I look forward to reading all of your comments and hopefully we can get back into a discussion on these topics in the next few days. That being said, I thank you so much for being here. As always, please be good to each other, and I will see you on the next one. Cheers.